Pringle looking towards Agard. Ravel, ambitious, but brilliant! Hello and welcome again to the New York Talk. Almost got the name wrong. We get nailed it in the end, though. Um, this is the Rotherham High podcast. Uh, we have a preview. We're going to look ahead to a home game in the middle of a return to New York after a couple of away games. And Crew Alexandra will be coming to the to New York Stadium after their midweek loss to Morecambe. Um, so they're coming in not a great deal of form. But we're going to look at what we can expect from the middle. There's plenty of topics to cover from the from the past week or so as well, which we're going to cover as well. Um, sponsorships and state of standing, and all of this, every a couple of other things which have uh, come up this week, which do affect us directly in in certain ways. So that's what we're going to cover. Um, we have Mick with us as always. Hello, Michael. Hello. Uh, Danny is back with us as always. Thank you for joining us, Danny. Hello. Always a pleasure. And Ben live from London. Sorry, Benjamin live from London oh. is joining us as well. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah, let's get on with the Miller's side of things first, shall we? Um, we come off the back of a really, really, really good 2 0 win at the weekend. Um, Mick, it's a different opposition on paper, it's a much weaker opposition. How much, how, how, how would you change the team? Would you change the team? Would you go bang right straight start and 11 to go again? Fitness depending. Uh, I think there's a couple of issues in there with the back. back. Three, first of all, I mean, Icky, Icky didn't play on Saturday because of a, a COVID slash traffic issue, weren't it? It wasn't an injury or anything like that. Um, I think you were isolated and then got caught in traffic and just basically didn't get didn't get to the ground in time. So um, whether Icky comes back in or not, I don't know. That's that's a, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I think the back back three, back five, um, were, played really really well on Saturday. Uh, particularly when you added Wes Harding into the mix there. Um, but as we alluded to in the, uh, the the last podcast, the home form is something we've got to we've got to just get on top of. So I think he's going to want to go all out for this, really. Um, so I, I, I suspect he may end up picking a very similar team to the one that started at Bolton, if not exactly the same. Mm. It'd be very harsh, Danny, to drop either Reg or Matter. You're not going to drop Woody because he's had a week's rest. Woody's the captain. And Icky, could, you could argue, deserves his place to start in 11. But based on the last two games, both Matter and Reg probably deserve their starting place as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's like um, Paul Warren said when I did the press conference with him. If you haven't seen that, it's on our YouTube. Go and watch it. Um, it is very hard to pick a starting 11 with with us just looking at it from last week's performance because he sees everybody in training and, and now they've been getting on. Um, but I think with Icky, if he has had a COVID scare and, all right, fair enough, he was out of isolation and m- <laughs> missed the bus, as it were, <laughs> getting to the ground, um, he, he will have to step up in training a little bit and try and earn his place back. But Reg has put down the gauntlet for him because he did mm. play very well at Bolton. Like we said in the last podcast, he made a couple of mistakes, but someone of that age and experience is going to. But he still played really well. Same with Matic. He's Bless him. He's always got a yellow card in him. We've seen, we've seen <laughs> that every time he's played. Um, but again, he's played really well and he's playing in a, in a position that suits him more weirdly, that's taken him, what, about three years to find whilst yeah. he's been with us. Um, but no, it, it's a very tough decision. But like I say, you can't really drop Woody because he's had his weeks rest, he's had his slippers on and his feet up. So he's he's been all right, and I, th- I reckon he'll start again on Saturday. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we're going to touch on again back to some of Ian, Ian Everett's comments from last week, Ben, um, about physicality. There was a talk again, we, we've, we covered it last episode, we ran a nice email from Steve I want to thank his emails is in because we talked about it and we we, we get every time we, the comment comes from almost every single manager. What's his face? Lincoln said it on the game before as well about our physicality. Um, Steve has emailed us in with a comparison of our height, how tall our, our players are compared to the Bolton players. And as it turns out, Ben, combined height, we are two inches taller. 
Um, <laughs> so, you know, that two inches makes all the difference, apparently, on a game of football. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth there, Mark. <laughs> being taller mean you're more physical? Well, th- this, this is my question and point. The physicality is clearly not height related because we're not that much taller. Two inches for in a in a you know in a height point of view is nothing. We weren't. They got more bookings, so they were they were clearly committed. You know, essentially the worst fouls. This physicality comment is going to keep coming up game after game, week after week. Can you see what other what the managers are saying? You know, when they say it, do you understand why they're saying? Because I struggle to understand it. I think it's a northern thing. Uh... To be honest with you, I don't know why. I have no idea. I like it. Um, mm-hmm. I think physical is a strong word. I don't think there's any mm-hmm. physicality in football anymore. Uh, so I think that's too a stronger word to describe mm-hmm. the sport. Um, but I like it. I mean, who wants to play against a physical team? But you know for me, I mean? physical, I like you've mentioned there, Ben, physical is the, the wrong word. Yeah. Just use the word strong. Yes, yeah. that, that's the, what well, they're trying to say. Is that, that don't, we're a strong that doesn't team. sell, does it? That don't, that doesn't yeah, make a good read on. That it make it a good sounds read. like the complimenters. If you say somebody's a strong team, that sounds like you're being positive. About it. And obviously, other managers don't want to be positive about little old Rotherham United, do they? No, I'd, I, I think it's just the generic media training that they get. You know, I don't Possibly. think it means maybe it doesn't mean anything. I like it. I mean, I, I like it. I don't see what the problem is with it. Let people call it physical. <laughs> okay. Mick. Uh, just lazy. Go on. Just lazy. Isn't it? It's just lazy. That's all it is. You know, we've got to think of it. We, we've lost or we haven't won. So we've got to think of a reason why and we'll just come up with some nonsense that we've heard somebody else spout before. You know, it's just it's just it's just laziness. Uh yeah, I don't think you'd hear Paul Warren trotting out that sort of Nonsense, quite frankly. Other than, other than when he called Wigan the Harlem Globetrotters. Well, yeah. I, I do. Well, well, no, you said yeah, that. but that's you not said, a stereotype, No, it? it's not. Exactly. Precisely. I mean, it's not as though everybody and the grandmother are calling Wigan Harlem Globetrotters, is it? <laughs> that's a funny comment as well. It's just, it's just, yeah, absolutely. Whereas everybody and the grandma seem to think that we're a strong physical bully inside. And it, you know, it's just whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, does it? realistically but it, it, it just says more about these opposition managers and journalists than it does about anything else really about whether we're physical or not hmm. i always take it as a dig danny i know i shouldn't t- t- take it but every, anything uh, the so when you when, you when it's your team you feel protective about them and when somebody t- t- says that I, it t- it's difficult not to take it personally for the team that you support because it, it feels like a dig yeah, and, and I think with some managers it is meant as a dig, but like Ben says, they've had enough media training to make it sound like it's not, and like it's a bit of a what's the word um, ambiguous comment where they can't really tell which way it's going to swing. I mean, the guy who normally commentates for us up when we're on Sky, he still thinks we're the long ball four uh, four five one team. Yeah, they're like yeah. not just play it to Michael Smith, and there you go, that's their game. Um, but I think because. This season, we have switched it up a little bit. Like, we're not just a 3 5 2 all out attack team, we do have the ability to sit back and defend, like we did at Bolton. Um, even with what Paul Warren said, he says we don't normally sit back, but we did it really well against Bolton. And I think it confuses a few managers, so they can't really pin us down with one way of playing. So they just go, Oh, they're just a physical team, that's why we lost, you know. It's like a cop out by saying, "Oh, they were better than us," but you can't really say that because then you get in trouble with your chairman. So it's like, "Oh, they were a physical team; they they out muscled us," you know. Yeah. So I, I think it's more that way inclined. Mm. Yeah, possibly. It is, it, we're, we're a difficult team to play against. We all know we're a difficult team to play against for a number of different reasons. Um, and for us, that's a good way. We've got, like Danny mentioned, we've got two or three different ways of doing teams over. Um, anyway, moving back onto. More what we'll expect on Saturday. Ben Smith and Grig started up top last Saturday. Freddie looks like he will be back in contention, although uh, there's still question marks how fully fit he is, and obviously Coyote is an option. Um, What's wrong but, with you? Ooh, Freddie. Freddie. Yeah. I think it was a foot injury. Yeah, it's, it's something to do with uh, fluid build up in his tendons on the top of his foot. You gonna have a dig about him about that, Ben? Or... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, he's been injecting water into his foot so he can have a rest. There you go. <laughs> um, even if Freddie's fully fit, Ben, you'd still be a bit daft to swap out Smith and Grigg from last week. Yeah, I mean, why are we even talking about Freddie? I think Grigg doesn't lose his starting job. I think, I think he's amazing. I think Grigg is a very amazing player. I think what he does off the ball what he does to get other teammates in space, what he does to get himself in space. Coming from someone who's not an analyst of the game, I think he look, I thought he played I think he's a really good player. Really smart player. I think he's one of them that doesn't play that plays seventy, eighty percent, but he does it in a way that he thinks about the game, you know, he's not in a lazy way. He just plays seventy, eighty percent to kind of hide in a way that makes sense to get himself into them positions. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think Greg comes out because that goal is coming. I don't say that often. I hate that phrase, but that goal is coming for him. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. I, th- I think it is coming. I do, do think it is a matter of time. Um, a word on Michael Smith. Um, the near post tweeted out today that Michael Smith has had the most amount of League One shots this season, um, which I'm a little surprised at, mate, because mm. in my head, Michael Smith is not somebody who shoots a lot. He's, he, does, he does a lot of the dog work, and then, but obviously he's had a goal to his sim. But, but Paul Warner's talked a lot in, his, in post and pre-match about asking his players to shoot more. And Michael Smith has clearly taken that on board. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're, we're, we're only into September and he's five goals to the good already, um, which which I, I, I accept is not, you know, it's not world-beating numbers, is it? But nevertheless, um, the numbers for Smithy, like you say, shots, Attempts on goal, goals, uh, the, the numbers are starting to stack up, not only for Michael Smith, but for the team as a whole and the individuals within that team. You know, they're starting to stack up in terms of where we sit in the um, with the, the, the rest of the league. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's just having a pop now, Smithy, isn't he? And, and, he, and they're coming off. They're coming off. But he's involved in everything up there. Um, and, and the key, like, like Ben's just said there, not only is Smithy involved in everything up there, Will Grigg is involved in everything up there as well when he's playing. Um, and that, for me, is a massive a massive part of it. He could have come to this club as, you know, Billy Big Balls, big name. You know, I'm not, I, I just, you know, just, just go and score a few goals and, and get my big move again. But he, he clearly hasn't, he either isn't that type of individual uh, or he's just, he's just coming here and, and, and going to enjoy himself. Uh, but he's certainly putting the work in. And and it's perfect for Smithy because it's just gonna it's gonna give Smithy that support that he needs, mm. I think. Um, you know, he's he's ploughed a bit of a lone furrow up there at times, has not he, yeah. Smithy? Yeah, yeah. Thing is as well because at the minute, well, well, in the past we haven't had people, we haven't had that star number two. So if Grig starts banging him in, then defend. I was going to say defences then. I hate I'm going to say defences because that's the most comfortable for me now. Defences won't be able to focus all their attention on Smith. If you mm-hmm. focus all your attention on Smith, Griggs is going to score. If you focus all your attention on Griggs, Smith is going to just be Michael Smith. So, I, th- I think if Griggs can start firing, then there's no reason why, you know, they can't both have 20 goals. Mm. Yeah, just to absolutely. just to jump in on the uh, the Smith comment, how he said he's at five goals already. Um, it took him until Boxing Day last time in League One to get five goals. Mm. Yeah, there you, you go. Know, the last the last minute here against Shrewsbury, and now it's taken yeah. him what eight games. Uh, and what have we been saying about Michael Smith for the last two or three seasons? If he had goals to his game, you know, he's going to be he's going to be unstoppable. Well, looks like that's what he's doing. Yeah, and like I say, it's all about it's, it's basically just down to shooting more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just allowing your players to have that freedom that if they have that shot and it doesn't go well, don't worry about it. We we want you to shoot, and that's how Wiles has got his goals last week. To be fair, you know yeah. he had that first shot which wasn't a very good one, and then the second one's paid off. Um, it's it feels like really good management. It, it may not turn out that way, you know, in the long run, but right now it feels like it's sort of working. Um, mm-hmm. Just a point of order, we will be doing the scouting report as part of this episode. Somebody from the Railwaymen podcast will be joining us shortly in this episode. Um, so we're going to get some questions in and find out about crew uh, in a moment. Before he comes in, let's talk about our head-to-head stats. Nick's favourite part of the show. Um, <laughs> we've got a very, very good record in recent history against crew. 
Uh, we have not lost in the last eight league meetings. That stretches back to 2004. Um, but it's been quite a while since we last played them. 2014 was the last time we played them in the league. Um, we won 4 2 uh, in the League One promotion campaign. Frecklington got two. Uh, Ravel scored and Agard scored. And Adam Collin did what he does and he saved a penalty. <laughs> there he goes. Um, one little stat I have for us is that Chio's next appearance will be his 50th for Rotherham United. And wow, he got there already. Yeah, uh, if he if it, if it wasn't injured all the time in the last two seasons, it might be near an hundred. Um, mm-hmm. But that's a good landmark for him uh, to get there. Um, other selection dilemmas is probably there's two other ones we could talk about. Then let's talk about wing back first of all. Chio came up at half time. Hall one, he wasn't injured, uh, but Hall one said he was working at around eighty percent, something around that figure. You said that mm-hmm. as if you said no, you said. Paul Warren wasn't injured. You said it as it. Oh, so Paul Warren wasn't injured. Paul, Paul might have been injured. I don't think Paul Warren was injured. Um, <laughs> Paul, once, Paul once said he wasn't. Chia wasn't injured, but he wasn't quite at one hundred percent gas. Um, what would you, Danny? It, it, it's, t- it's really tempting against a team like Crew. We expect to be more positive against the start duo, but he might need to come on with half an hour left. I mean, we can let Wes Arden have a start. It's, it's difficult, really. We aren't knowing more detail from our point of view, I suppose. Yeah, but I think it, it comes down to, no disrespect to Crew or anything, but Bolton have a lot more quality in their side. You know, they weren't third before they played us for nothing. Um, mm. But like but like I say, that that could be the reason why Chair was only uh, going at 80%, you know, because he's, he's had to end. We played uh, Tuesday as well. So that could have been a factor. Um, but I think with Chio, I think it was the right decision to take him off when one did, because it allowed Harding to come in and sit that ever so slightly bit deeper and it, it it didn't necessarily nullify Bolton but it did enough to keep mm. to keep the, the lock on the door if you like um but no I think on Saturday we should start Chio you know in, injury willing um just just because I think he'll just dominate that right hand side like he normally does the only downside is we haven't got Mikel Miller back after his suspension because he's injured. It's only a man and niggle from what I've read, so he should be back for Tuesday. Um, but that then allows maybe uh, Boller to come in and have another solid game or potentially Shane Ferguson to come back in and, and try and put his cap on his place. But no, I, I think if you, if you start off Benny on Saturday, he will do what he does, run his arse off and uh, create a lot of chances for us, which, granted, we've got the history on our side against Crew, but that's not necessarily a good thing because yeah. look, Fle- look at Fleetwood, you know. True. Yeah, there was an interesting stat from the, from the Crew stats, so just doing back on the stats. We've been beaten in the last eight games. Prior to that period, we'd only won one of the last 11 meetings. It, go- it goes in swings against Crew, and we did lose in the FA Cup last time, uh, which I didn't mention. So... History sometimes is funny. Mick, you're going to make a fun of my math and my history, or are you going to make a serious point? No, it was just about. No, I'm not bothered about that. I'm not bothered about what, what's <laughs> happening in the past. Um, just talking about, just thinking about that uh, substitution of Chio on uh, on Saturday. I think it par- partially was tactical, obviously, to show up the defence. And I, I, I just wonder whether one of the reasons why Chio wasn't operating at 100 percent was because he he got half a mind on his defensive duties. Bearing in mind the strength that Bolton have got down that down their left side. Um, he obviously had a, a part to play defensively, which didn't allow him to commit fully to his, you know, to his offensive um, duties, if you like. So I, I just wonder whether that might be another reason why he wasn't operating at hundred percent. And bear in mind as well that the, the kicking he took at Lincoln on uh, on Tuesday night, um, and not just a kicking, but you know. Body slamming and all sorts of everything else that he, uh, he was subjected to at Lincoln. So, um, but I think mainly that that substitution was tactical. Um, so, really, I'm sure he'll start on Saturday. I don't see any reason why he won't start on Saturday unless unless he is injured, which there's no suggestion that that's the case, is there? So, no, no, absolutely. Uh, we'll come around later on in the show and talk about some more stuff. Let's now turn our attention to our opponents on Saturday. Um, let's bring in the scouts reports. We have a Tim Robinson joining us from the Railway Podcast. Thank you for joining us, Tim. Hi, guys. How's it going? Good, very good. Thanks, yourself. Yeah, not bad. Um, a little bit of a busy day. Just the cricket to watch uh, <laughs> the 
the red the red roses bring home hopefully the county championship um just arrived back um but yeah how's it going with you guys very good thank you very much um go on, mate. no i have I'm, I'm, i've got nothing constructive to say as i because i never do have so <laughs> <laughs> Um, so for people that haven't listened to the Sky Report before, we're just going to team about crew, what to expect, uh, this, how the season's gone so far. Um, the first question we have to ask really as a Rotherham fan is to start with David Artel, a uh, former Rotherham player from Rotherham. Um, it feels like from the outside that he's doing a really, really good job and not the best start of the season, but how has he? How, was, how is David Artel doing? Yeah, so, he, so he's, he's five years in. Um, he's made progress. He's... Um, He's got a lot of credit in the bank with crew fans. Um, we could probably be bottom of Christmas and you wouldn't find a single dissenting voice about the way he runs the club, about his leadership, about his um, general... The, the way he acts, the way he behaves, the, the, the structure he gives the team, the structure he gives the club. I think he's... Um, he, he, he's, he's got a lot of credit in the bank with crew fans and yeah, you're right, it's yeah. it's not, but there's been a lot of hurdles that have kind of sprung up overnight, un, unforeseen um, yeah. and I think most crew fans he, he, you know, he, he, he's got a lot of latitude for, from all of us um, you know, he, he, he took over, we were in the lower reaches of he's both in terms of the the football we've played, the the results we've had, and the the finishing position in the league, he's made progress in every single season, uh, culminating in promotion in nineteen twenty from from League Two in the curtailed season we went up on PPG, and then uh, a top half finish in League One the, the season after. You can't really ask for more than that. Um, so yeah, he's 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 extremely popular. He's 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 probably the most popular manager we've had since Dario. Yeah, it's it's been a di- it's been a difficult start, but there's a there's a lot of reasons why that it has been difficult. They're kind of beyond his control. Mm. Yeah, what, what well, let's talk about those problems. So, uh, what is Cruz? Obviously, in the previous years, we met in the championship uh, a few years ago. Now that we, we you know that's league, Cruz aren't always a League One and League Two team. Is that where you think they, the limit is right now, League One, League Two, or is that like top half finish last season? Do you think there is that possibility within the club to move to that extra step further forward? So, in. I mean, un- unless you're talking about the 1890s when there was only only two divisions, um, Cruz spent nine years in total in 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 the championship, or you know, mm. and actually most of our history we've been in the fourth tier, and and probably the the majority of that time has been bouncing around at the bottom of the fourth tier, applying for re-election, so. Um, Look, the polarisation of, of the leagues um, that we're seeing in the moment where the Premier League might be playing a different sport, the absolute ceiling for crew, I would say, is is scrapping for survival in the championship. I think best for crew um, is probably a top half League One. Um I mean, Dave Artell, if anyone can, possibly could get us to the um, to the to the championship, but um, it it would require from us, you know, spec- an an amazing um, crop of really really high caliber youngsters to come through um, all all at the same time. If 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 that was going to happen, and you know, you 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 talk. <laughs> You're talking, you know, rolling double sixes um, at the same time. And, you know, if anyone can do it, it's Dave Artell. Um, but, yeah, uh, look, our, our natural our natural home is surviving or, or, or doing quite well in League One. Mm. Fair enough. What we talk about, we've done a few, few other clubs this season. Uh, how is the ownership structure at Crew? Is that, is, is that a positive place? Is, is, there, is there lots of positive places or is, is there some issues there? Yeah, no, no. It's, it's, it's really positive. So, um, 
we've we've been a sort of family owned, family run club um, for 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 a long time. You know, um, small business man. There's no, there's no kind of like a, a crew, and then there never has been, and and there never will be. Um, the long time um, chairman, I, I guess, John Bowler retired after the um publication in into the report into mm. child abuse uh, obviously by now in our club um he he saw that report through he he, he saw the whole dark sorry phase in our, our history through and then stepped down once that had gone charles grant's taken over he's a local businessman very successful previously although not in the, in the 90s um and when Charles Grant took over, or, or actually slightly before, during during the pandemic, um, the the club was offered the chance to uh, to buy out a significant shareholder that had probably not had the club's best interests at heart. And as part of that, the fans were given the opportunity to buy into the club. So um, the 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 fans were given a ten week window, twenty to raise uh, two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to buy a twelve point five percent stake in the club, and effectively um, take on one eighth ownership of, of, of mm. the football club. Um, but it we, we were given a finite window in which to raise that yeah. money. Impressive that the the fans managed to do that. So we now right. have a fan representation on the board. And we have a new chairman that is a local guy, and so far, every everything's everything is rosy. Um, the club's in a good place. I don't think you would have uh, from any crew fan around um, the the leadership of the club either from the um, the 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 owner stroke chairman Charles Grant or from from David Artell. We're all kind of singing off the off the same hymn sheet, which is the last couple of years um, in football and, and, and in general society is, is, is kind of a nice place to be. And it means that when you do have challenges like we've experienced at the start of this season, um, it means that because we're all pulling in the same direction, it makes them all a little bit easier to deal with. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good to hear. We like to hear when there's we've, there's lots of bad stories at the minute, as well documented with bad ownership and issues. It's good to hear that there is a good ownership around in football. Uh, yeah, Lincoln fan last week and a few other clubs. Well, it's good to see there are good, good people in football. Well, we're a club that's been through the mill, um, you mm. know, in, in, in more ways than one. So it's it's just nice to sort of finally be in a place where, you know, we feel like we're on an even keel and we feel like we're all right. We, we may not ever, you know, achieve the things that we want. We're going to do it together, and at least we're going to do it, you know. Um, Without someone, you know, pulling pulling the floor from underneath us. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Well, let's talk about this season. Uh, was it five points so far? So far, um, actually, the top half finished last season. So maybe we, we, were you coming into the season? What was the expectation? Was it a similar sort of thing, or was it really that t- this tough league this year? We all know how tough this league is this year. Um, what were what the preseason expectations? So we really positive, really, really good couple of years. You know, we mm. we got promoted in the in the in the COVID curtail nineteen twenty. We were actually top when the the season finished, but um, Swindon had played a game less, so they actually won the league. On P- I genuinely think we'd have won the league that season. We were we were absolutely flying. We had a great season the following year in League One. Um, the other three teams that came up all struggled for um, to survive in in the division. Two of them went down. We finished in the top half. So that that for us was you know about what we expected. We there were times when we thought we might kick on for the playoffs, but it was on the whole a positive season. But we knew after those two really really good seasons, and we had we had a really good and a batch of academy youngsters that had. Had, had by that point played 150, 200 games, and and we knew a, a lot of those guys would move on. So Perry and G um, went to Cardiff. 
uh, Harry Pickard went to Blackburn, Cardiff, and then and then on to um, he's a, he's a Blackpool now. Um, Omar Beckles was uh, was not an academy kid, but he was excellent in the first half of our, our first season in League One, and he moved to Leighton Orient. He wanted to move back down to London, so core of an excellent team, and it was all about how we'd rebuild really and, and which players we bring in to replace the players that we knew would be leaving um and it looked like the recruitment was pretty good so what were the expectations the expectations were probably that it was going to be a difficult second album for us but mm. uh in league one but that we'd probably be okay um and then just a whole heap of um, sprung up out of nowhere just on the eve of the season that really kicked us in the um, in the stomach, and um, mm. that that really made life difficult. And and kind of so, I, I, my expectations personally were top half. You know, again, mm. everything that went on just on the eve of the season, it made it made those expectations. You, you know, you, immediately you were thinking we're never going to achieve what we thought we were. Mm. What were those issues? You know, the issue at the start of the season. Were it just it was injuries and things like that, or what? What was the problems that? Not so much injuries. So, um, two two of the signings that we made: um, Tommy Hobbin, who played a full season for Aberdeen and their fourth place finish mm. in the SPL last season, um, came in as a. Um, very highly physically dominant centre half that we needed, and then mm. retired without playing a game to become a financial advisor on the eve of the season. Um, <laughs> okay, wow. Uh, Sean McDonald, who we um, brought in, yeah. uh, you know, Sean McDonald, you'll, you'll know very well. We it, it, well on on the eve of the season, or, or just after the start of the season, he uh, retired from football as well. Um, to, to be closer to his family. So two of the absolute rocks that we thought we were, our season was going to depend on um, as the season started. Mm. And, and, you know, you, you know what recruitment's like. You you spend six months picking your targets out and you yeah. once you've chosen those targets, you've lost out on all the other guys who you might have gone for. Um, so for for two of those really key guys to turn up and then disappear within um, a couple of weeks of each other was was bizarre. But then as as well as that, we had uh, COVID and also norovirus outbreaks after the season started, which meant a couple of times we weren't able to field even um, five subs. As well as that, one of our star players from the academy, Tommy Lowry, has been involved by his agent not to sign a new contract because the agent wants there to be a release clause within that contract that would be tantamount to um, and because of that um, the manager's decided that he, he will be permanently until the, the contract negotiation mm. is sorted uh, unavailable for selection um, and then also we sold Charlie Kirk to Charlton our, our left winger from absolutely brilliant and Erwin Dale, our right winger, um, went on strike and refused to play for the club anymore. And um, we've we've now loaned him to to Blackpool just to get him basically off, off the books mm. because he's he's. So, from a position where we thought, okay, we've got some holes, but we filled them. Mm. We're now literally as the season has started in a position where we're struggling to field a team. Wow. That sounds like an absolute nightmare, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's been a tough few weeks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, so, you, yeah, you we, filled the we, holes, but new holes have appeared. So, yeah, so we, we, had, a, we had a second wave of uh, recruitment literally as the window closed. Um, and, I, you know, recruited well but it's very very early so I think most teams now have sort of played seven eight nine games this mm. season we've really only played two or three with this new team mm. yeah um let's talk about the vision results we played you played Tuesday night which may not work in your favor but I would play Tuesday and Saturday 
Um, how was Morecambe? When we, we played Morecambe a few weeks ago, I was quite impressed with Morecambe. I, I, they were very solid and a bit difficult. Our assistant manager in our press, pre-match press conference has said that you sh- you guys should have got something out of the game and you should be disappointed. How, was is that a fair fair assessment? Well, they they had, they had four shots on target and scored three goals. But I mean, I don't <laughs> think we deserve to get anything out of the game. I thought Morecambe were the better team. Um, fair play to them. I, I thought they were excellent. Uh, they, I just thought that they were they were really canny. They were really mm. canny. Um, t- I think tactically they probably surprised us. They caught us a little bit cold. I don't I don't think we played superbly well, especially defensively. But um, in it, to to put the Morecambe game on Tuesday where we lost three uh, one at, at home. In, into a little bit of context, this team's only been together for the last three games. So we mm. we we drew one all uh, um, at Shrewsbury. We beat nil uh, at the weekend, and then we came into the Morecambe game, you know, really confident on the back of those two decent results. Um, and then, yeah, that, it 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 was a game where it, it could have gone either way, but. Um, you know, fair fair play to him. And yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'd agree with your assessment, man, is that we deserve something out of the game. I think, you know, Morecambe fully deserved their win for me. Hmm. Fair enough. Um, to give us an, is, is, you know, it's, it's quite a new group, but are, who are the danger men? Who should Rotherham fans be watching out as uh, as crew's big threat on Saturday? So, so I, I'm, I'm convinced that Mika Manjon is our greatest asset on the pitch. He's our number nine. He's our target man. Um, he's he's a he's a pretty physical player, but he's he's scored three of our five uh, league goals this season, and um, basically every everything comes through him. He's he's a much higher caliber of striker that we're we're used to having a crew. Um, the big problem for us this season has really been and that have been able to support him. Um, mm. We we seem to have done that to a certain extent. We've brought in um, Janiel Bennett from Tottenham on loan. Um, he he's played in Tottenham's team in Europe this season, and he he, he set Man John's goal up on Tuesday. Um, he he scored one on Saturday against Burton, and the other one was well, it was given as an own goal, but it was his his ball in um, that that caused the own goal. So he's going to he's going to play on the left. Janiel Bennett, um, Mika Mandran, Scott Kashka, who you may know from um, mm, from Wickham, Wickham mm. um, has come in, and he's sort of playing on the right. I'm not a hundred percent convinced that a sort of a, the right of the three position is is perfect for Kashka, but he's you know he's he, he's lively, easy, and if he can get closer to Mandran rather than having to track back like he, he did a lot on um on Tuesday then I'm sure he'll he'll he will cause a threat. Um but they 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 probably be the three that you'd you'd be worried about from, from our point of view. Mm. I remember Cash from last season, the first game of last season at Wickham. We end up winning the game but it causes all sorts of problems. Um so we're 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 aware of him from that game really. Mm. Um uh, any other yeah. questions that he's, he's only played two oh, ninety okay. minutes? Uh, okay, so, sorry, um, he, he's only played two minutes on that this season, and he's looked lively. So if if you know if if his if his stamina and his fitness is and his match sharpness is is is, is still on the upgrade, then he, he he might be he might be quite lively on Saturday. I think. Hmm. Uh, Mick, Ben, Danny, anything else you want to ask Tim before we let him go? No, I think he's um, given us a very nice overview of what crew is going to bring to the table and uh, what's already happened at their table this season. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like yeah. quite a lot, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> yeah. One, um, one of the things I would say is that it's, it's good to see that it's another club at this level that's been run properly. <laughs> you know, that yeah. it, we're starting to it's starting to get to a stage now where there there really is a, a, a starting to open a bit of a gulf between. The clubs that are run properly and the clubs that are that are gambling, aren't they? So it's nice to see another one that's uh, run properly. How's uh, how's Will Grigg getting on for you guys? Never early days, but um, quite interesting to see how he 
um, how he pans out. Very positive so far. Um, he's he's hasn't, he's scored in the league, in the Pizza Trophy against Donny, um, but his all round play I think has impressed everybody. It came to us was just sort of thinking, oh, we've got a you know a fox in the box type player, but he's shown more than that already. His work rate is very very good. He's very clever. Um, yeah. We're all very excited, to be honest with you. It's, really, it's a bit strange. We're not used to getting excited, getting excited about people. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're hoping he's not on fire on Saturday anyway. So uh... <laughs> It's been smouldering a little bit, hasn't it, I think. <laughs> um, it, the, the thing that's amazed us more than anything else, like, like Matt alluded to there, was, you know, he, he, you know, he comes with a, with a big name and a big reputation, but he, he clearly is no stranger to rolling his sleeves up and really getting stuck in. Which, which is a bit of a surprise for us, to be honest, and and it really matches the ethos that that Paul Warren has got running throughout the squad. So it's um, he seems so far touch wood to be um, to be a good fit. Mm, hopefully, is um, <laughs> is is Ollie Rathbone a big danger for us on Saturday? Because I've heard a lot of good things about him as well. Yeah, I think he's still running from last week. I mean, he's, he's just <laughs> he is he's just one of them yeah. people that just he's completely non-stop. Um, yeah, go on, Danny. I'll let you feel this one. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like Forrest Gump. He just doesn't stop running at all. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, he just doesn't stop running. His work rate's really high, but he's also very good on the ball. And um, he has been a very dangerous footballer for us this season. It's, uh, I think it has caught a few Rotherham players off guard as well, because we knew how good he was at Rochdale, but we didn't expect him to just crack on with it with us we thought there'd be mm. like a bedding in period uh but now it, it, he's literally hit the ground running and he's just carried on running for his whole time so far he massively <laughs> against us last season mm. Mm. yeah it should be a decent game our home form's terrible yeah. um yeah. so you never know <laughs> um before we let you go tim i'll put you on the spot what do you think I'll, can i ask for a score prediction so when I did my um, one to twenty fours for League One last season, mm. you you guys were top, and I, I I just thought you know Paul Warren's such a smart cookie, and even if you hadn't bought anyone in, I just thought you, you know you he knew you out of this division, and you know there was Ipswich and Sunderland's and all, but they they had such huge cheer, and I just thought you could sign no one. And you'd be up there anyway. And I think the, the signings of Greg and, and Rathbone and, you know, a couple of others, to me, they just looked... Look, I think we're in a better place than we were three weeks ago, but it's, it's impossible for me to um, really see us getting anything out, out of this. I think it's it's probably the, the, the trickiest away game of the whole season. Um New ground for me, and I'm really looking forward to it. I think you know I've been to Millmore a few times. This this will be the first time I've mm. been to the new place. Um, but I just I'm going with very low expectations, and I, I find I find it impossible to predict anything other than a home win. I'll, I'll go. I'll go. Bro, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Tim. Thank you for coming on. Thank and you. Good luck yes, for the rest you. of the season. Not Saturday, but good luck for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, lads. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Uh, so there we go. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Railway Men, for sending Tim through to us. We really, really appreciate that. Um, the let away us... fans paid as a compliment. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird in League One, isn't it? Um, it's really weird. People, you know, in the Championship, there was a lot of snobbery towards Rotherham United. Mm. Um, yeah. Let's. I, I, it's weird. I mean, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of snobbery from one particular club who appears to be in a bit of trouble this season as well. Yes. We will, we're will. we going to come back to Rotherham at the end. Well, we're going to talk about so, other topics um, right now because there are other topics that affect, have affected Rotherham United and will affect Rotherham United. Let's start with a big one, Derby County, getting a point deduction for administration and a potential point deduction. So they could end up on minus 21 points. Is effectively where we are. Ben's laughing already. You know what? That's um, better than them getting relegated last season. I think it it is. we're, we're going to be quick at this. We want to keep this under an hour, so we are. So we are going to try and you know cover this quickly. Um, but the chickens have come home to roost, Mick. This has been coming for years. As outsiders, we all we all known this has been coming for years, and it's happened. Yeah. 
Sounds. And I've, I, I mean, I've got lots and lots of sympathy for Derby fans. Please don't get me wrong. But everything that I've said in the past about Derby and Mel Morris and the way that Derby County have been run, it's nothing to do with the supporters. I desperately feel sorry for him. You know, their club has been mismanaged uh, over a period of time by a man or a board who have just taken a gamble season after season that they're going to hit the jackpot and they've come up short every time. But they're not the only club, are they? Um, you know, Derby County as a club deserve the punishment that they get and probably more. Derby County is a set of supporters. They do not. But unfortunately, the two are inextricably linked like we were all those years ago when we got the however many thousands of points just <laughs> taken off as what or what it felt like. You know, it, you know, the club is the club, so um mm. and the fans are the club, so you know you're gonna have to take your punishment. Um yeah, I mean it's good. I, I'm glad that this has happened because it's gonna hi it's highlighting the problem that, that particularly is prevalent in the championship, but also in this division as well. Alice Sunderland and Ipswich and Wigan and Bolton and, and all these other clubs as well. So, you know, we talked about it earlier on uh, ten, 10 minutes ago with, with Tim and, and our crew, Alexandra, uh, a decent, uh, a well run club. Um, is that, is that, me? No, is that me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's oh, my it's watch that keeps me. pinging for some reason. Yeah, so. I keep expecting a train to arrive at a train yeah. station or something. <laughs> um, you might turn it off, mate. Yeah, no problem. I, I'm so, uh, so, yeah, so. Like you said, chickens are coming home to roost, aren't they? Um, and I, I've talked many times, particularly when we're in the Championship, about Reading and the issues at Reading and the 200 and odd percent of their income spent on wages. It looks like they're going to be going into administration as well. And yeah. Yeah, but will they though? If I had a pound for every time someone said they didn't win any they're, they're, they're getting nine points. I'd be, able to, I'd be able to pay their debt off. They're, they're, oh. Yeah, they're not going out of administration yet, but they are getting nine points for for breaking oh. uh, profit and sustainability. Oh, uh, Rumoured, it's, it's 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 the same nine points Derby are going to get. So um, they've got AFL have gone from not giving any point deduction to just giving them out for coming. Yeah, late they, they've the they've turned into Oprah, haven't they? You get a point deduction. <laughs> you get a point deduction. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see they're taking it seriously for once, though. This is what it needs. This is what yeah. it needs. Yeah, punish them. But clubs are still going to continue to gamble while ever, yeah, while ever that but, big pot. Now they know uh, what the consequences are. Now they know. Well, I, yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully. But you know, the, a point that uh, I'm not sure who it was who made the point. I read it on Twitter. I don't know with Andy Holt or whether it, the, uh, from Accrington or whether it was Kieran Maguire from the Price of Football. Uh, you know, Mel Morris has taken a 60 million pound gamble one season to get up for the for the prize of 200 million. It didn't work, so he spent another sixty million the following season. That didn't work. He's only spent one hundred and twenty million. If he gets up in the third season where he spent sixty million, he's still going to get two hundred million for going up. You know that 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 gamble three or four times. Once out of three or four times, you're going to get lucky. Yeah, it well, clearly it didn't work. Out. Yeah, yeah. Well, Villa and um, Villa are up there, aren't they? And and, and other clubs like that. So so you, it, it's possibly not. A problem necessarily with, um, or not just a problem with management, but also with the, the rewards that are on offer and the inequity of yeah. how that to that money is distributed. Yeah, let's talk about how it comes down to on. greed, really. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, you probably right. Well yeah, um, let's see how it, let's talk about how it, how it could have affected Rotherham United. Now, I don't subscribe to this, but Wickham are effectively looking at taking legal action. Because they feel like if Derby Derby should have got this point deduction last season, so part of it last season, they should have got a point deduction last season. Uh, Mel Morris has said, essentially said that if they didn't do something which caused them to go administration, they would have got a point deduction last season. Uh, Wickham is saying that they would have stayed up. Now I know that's what the table says, Danny, but there would have been so many ifs and buts, and, and how you know it would. It's like predicting the web that a spider is going to spin. It would have been impossible to say, "Oh, Wickham would have definitely stayed up." And I mean, we can say they're going to put legal, put legal documents on it. Like, you can understand sort of where they're coming from. Like, oh, we could have stayed in the championship if you would have followed the rules. But the EFL did put down the gauntlet of if you didn't give us the financial information by this date, we were going to relegate them anyway. That's mm. why for Wickham and, and Derby, they released two sets of fixtures, like for championship and league one. Derby got 
by some miracle, their financial papers from three years running into the AFL on the deadline. So the AFL didn't have a leg to stand on, so the table is as it is. Mm. All right, fair enough. If Derby did get the point deduction last season, then, yeah, Wickham would have stayed up. Fair enough. Uh, they would have stayed up from two clubs having points deductions, mind, but they would, they would have stayed up. But at the same time, the EFL had no legal binding to put that points deduction on Derby last season because they didn't have the evidence. So they've had to, they've given them the deadline, they've met it, and they've gone, right, so you did do it. So they've done the next best thing, which is to put it on this season. And if we can be good enough, we'll go back up this season and then get to laugh at Derby, who will probably come down this season. But they're not good Definitely. enough. They're not well, good enough. Well, they never have been point. good enough. They weren't good enough for last well, like, year. Like, 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 like I say, if, if they're good enough, they'll go back up to the championship. Yeah. If they're not good enough, then they'll be playing Derby next season. This is why this, this is why this I know uh, me because oh I feel like this. If you wanted to stay up, you shouldn't have finished in the relegation zone. <laughs> like uh, is it me? But what they're saying is the rules of football. Is it just me? Um, I think Mel I think Mel Morris has effectively effectively said this, admitted this. If they would have submitted their accounts on time, they would have got a points deduction because their their accounts didn't match up. So what they did is they didn't submit their accounts. And they waited and submitted them as less possible, which meant they didn't get a points deduction. If they had done it on time, they would have got points last season. So that's, that's where the argument comes uh, from. The point, you don't, the point deduction don't even come into the equation for me. If you wanted to stay up, you should have finished out of the relegation zone because you weren't good enough. And you're not good you enough to become a lawyer. Up, so this is why you're doing it now. Why do you <laughs> think we are? Why, no, why do you think we aren't taking... Um, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because no, without, cause without the points deduction, we wouldn't have stayed up. That's why. Uh, is, is, we would still been sat where we were. <laughs> oh, is, there not, is there not a sweet, a certain amount of sweet irony in the fact that Wickham got relegated on the basis of Derby wasting time? I mean, that's just so sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. You know what I mean, yeah, yeah that is fair. Yeah. For me, that's fully deserved. You know, what I mean, after, after Wickham's irony. performance last season, I, I mean, yeah. You deserve it. Don't bother. Don't bother having any sort of uh, legal action because you're gonna fail, mind you. They'll not take it until December, will they? Because they'll be still be still be trying to find ball. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, I've got any more on this season because I can upset them and all if you want. I'm sure you're obviously <laughs> listening. Um, one more line that's not directly Rotherham United related, but is potentially going to be Rotherham United related. Um, the betting sponsorship. Uh, rules now. The government are talking about this hasn't been confirmed. The government are talking about banning um, betting companies from being shirt sponsors of, of football clubs. Certainly, the Premier League. I assume it's going to fit in below. Rather than I, are not sponsored by that, as you can see by this one. This one. IPM Group uh, are the current sponsors um, who are doing a stellar job of uh, match day facilities. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, that bit. Said that ironically, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the AFL is sponsored by Sky Bet. Um, there are other clubs in the Championship and League. When we, I think in the Championship, we were about four or five clubs that weren't sponsored by betting companies. I think it's tough. It's, it's, it's a good step, Mick. It's a good step that they are not that they are not promoting betting companies because most of these betting companies are just fronts anyway. They're not. <laughs> they are just essentially fake companies. Um, there is a gambling problem in football where people are effectively told to gamble and it's caused a lot of problems. People, people's personal lives, a lot of people's personal lives it's, have been it's affected by this. It's, it's a gambling in, yeah, problem well, exactly. in, work, in life. Yeah, and it's good that football are taking these steps and it is early days and there are more questions to be asked, but it's a good step in the right direction that these steps are being taken. It's a shame the government have to do it and that the football can't solve this problem itself, but it's a good step anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. I think for me, uh, the cynic image just says it's more of a PR exercise for for the, for the EFL because you know there's a bandwagon that's rolling past the EFL headquarters and they're going to jump on it. Um, but How have you managed to turn that into well, a negative? It's a good but, thing. No, I'm it's not, like someone don't need any money to charity and you say no, oh, they're jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, I just, like, I just, I just, I just feel that they've got bigger fish to fry, uh, but it's something that they can use. As a, as a smoke screen for inactivity and doing other, in other things. Um, that these sorts of issues, and I'm not, listen, I'm not belittling the issue in any way, at all, not at all, because it is an issue for a lot of people. 
um, you know, but so is going out every Saturday and getting absolutely hammered off your face. But we don't talk about whether we're going to, you know, about drink and everything else. Which, but but anyway, that's by that's that's by the by. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, it's a good thing. It definitely is a good thing. But it's going to remove some cash out of, out of the uh, out, of, out of football. Um, it's what going to remove need? cash out of clubs. It needs because it's getting out of hand. In my opinion. <laughs> Well, it's about the just—it's about, it's about, it. the, it's about, about the distribution it. of the cash within the game, rather than rather than anything else. But, but yeah, listen, it is a good thing. It is a good thing. But I, I am cynical. I am yeah. cynical as to the motives behind it from the, from an EFL point of view, and whether they are going to release Sky Bet. I doubt that very much. Well, I seem to recall, and I may be wrong. Sky Bet tried to get out of this contract a couple of years ago with the EFL. I can't remember what it is. Some, somebody may be listening and, and maybe correct. I think two or three years ago, there was Skybet wanted to get out of the EFL contract if they could find, if the EFL could find a replacement and they couldn't find a replacement for the equivalent money. But that's, that, that's not a surprise with Skybet, is it? Because they don't go any customers because every time somebody wins with them, they ban them. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, 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 then, but, then the, but then this is a problem you talk about wealth in football. If there's nobody else to pay the money that Skybet are willing to pay, then the EFL are going to be out of pocket. Then and Rick Perry won't have that, will he? Well, Rick, well, exactly. But it, so it's it's a really good thing they're doing it, Danny. But there are going to be to look at the other side of things, which are, are less important than people's lives. I accept there are is, this is going to bring, potentially bring up issues for finances. It might just knock off a few sponsors at Premier League, but that means they've got to find new sponsors and would have maybe gone to Championship and they and so on and so on. It, it is going to potentially cause problems. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if if this does become law and you and you can't have betting companies sponsoring your front of shirts, there'll be some clause very quietly uh, put into it that says you can still have a betting company until the end of their current deal. So if yeah. Birmingham and Coventry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if Birmingham and Coventry have still got what is it, Boyle Sports who sponsor them yeah. or something, if they've still got four years left on their deal, they can still have it for four years. Whilst if you're at end of your deal, then tough look you're gonna have to be sponsored by cheerios or something um (laughs) but i think finding a sponsor for the for the football league won't be that much of an issue i think it does come to the cash cow of who was wanting to pay the most money Mm. oh you're not paying as much as sky oh we're not going to have you but you you know the efl have the capabilities to find a new sponsor they'll probably make it the tesla football league or something (laughs) You know, yeah. can, you imagine, can you imagine that Elon Elon Musk championship or something? But, but, but for me, for me, it comes down to what happened with smoking ads back in the seventies and eighties. They used to be everywhere at football grounds, and used to be people walking around selling them on like little trays, like get your box of fags and everything. That got clamped down on, and it I disappeared. That. And that that was a brilliant thing. And you could say that gambling is as harmful to your wallet. Is smoking is to your lungs, mm. and it's just natural progression of they'll find somewhere else. It's like people will still be fon- sponsored by finance companies, you yeah. know that that that's different. But it's the thing that promotes gambling to a younger audience. Who, let's face it, you, anyone can fake being eighteen when it's an app on your phone, and that and yeah. that could ruin some people. So I think it, it is does. a good thing, and it'll improve a lot of people's mental health and a lot of people's uh, sustainability in themselves. It might create a little bit of a void, but then voids are made to be filled. You know, yeah. you could you could get a vast ways of people sponsoring who probably didn't dabble in it before, like TikTok, for mm. example. Yeah, uh, the people. Hey, oh, you know, what, always, do you know what TikTok There's always is a way make? of finding ways around it. Well, go on. Then. I said, do you know what TikTok is, mate? Yeah, it's what my clock does, mate. Uh, yeah, um, there's always ways around it. You're looking <laughs> looking at other company, other industries, the alcohol, for example. In certain countries, alcohol is banned to be sponsored. So what they do is they sponsor their brand as zero alcohol. So it doesn't break any laws, but you're still promoting your brand. What do you um, mean? So Peroni, for example, and Heineken. Heineken's a good one for, for F1. Heineken sponsors F1. But all the Heineken adverts at F1 are almost always alcohol-free Heineken adverts. Because in uh... certain countries, you're not allowed to sponsor alcohol. So there's... Yeah. Uh, it's, it's almost, the gambling's different to that, but I suspect people will try and find ways around it and they might um but it's a step it's a positive step in the right direction um which we all support ben i assume you support it as well yeah yeah there's going to be some uh some dodgy far eastern 
gambling companies sweating on where they're going to launder the money next. I think they soon. <laughs> yeah, you know, because that, a lot of that, a lot of that has happened through football clubs in this country um, over over the years, and, and will definitely, without doubt, still be happening now. So, mm. yes, if if yeah. of course the EFL actually stick to the guns, which phew, is the first time for everything, isn't they? Yeah. Um, this is going to go a bit long, so apologies if you listen. Right. Probably, we've probably got another ten minutes to cover stuff here, yeah, so I don't want to rush through some some topics because we want to talk. That's an important topic which we're all behind, and most football fans are. Um, so, moving on, let's go back to Rotherham United. Let's go back down to Rotherham United. Starting line on yeah. Saturday, Ben. The midfield dilemma is not solved. If anything, after Saturday, it's more difficult. <laughs> I feel like it's it's one of those that Paul. I know I know Paul wouldn't, wouldn't think this. But it made Paul Warren's job a lot easier if a couple of them had a really bad game. Because then you don't have to pick them. Now he's stuck because he's got six players all in form. Yeah, the thing is, like, it's a better problem to have than none of them playing well and you mm. don't know who to play. You yeah, know what I mean? True. It's a better problem than that. But, I mean, it's that uh, one he said in the press conference with Danny. Like, it, we don't know. He, the, 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 the dilemma might have already been solved. <laughs> You know what I mean? In training, because let's just say, for example, Lindsay and Wiles have been playing awful in training. Rathbone, Barlasser and um, who else ever, whatever, have been playing really well in training. You know what I mean? So, and then they, them three yeah. start. It, it's a... Uh, it's, yeah. I'm glad I'm not the one making the decision, if I'm being perfectly honest. For me, Barlaster goes in there. I don't know why he came out, but I didn't see. But like he said in the thing, uh, I didn't know he had a. What was it? What did he say? He had done here foot injury. What was it? Ankle? Um, I think what it was, was it? just it, it and everybody else were just that bit better in training, and he dropped out, and then oh, suddenly right. he's come back in again. Oh, right. I thought he said like a, a had a foot injury, but no, that that you were, know what I mean. That was Freddie that with foot injury, oh, in, and then right. Fergie as well for a bit. So yeah, for me, Barlaster goes in with if if. If we're picking it where just on paper, not taking training into account, which is not a very good thing to do, but like, you know what I'm saying? Wiles, Rathbone and uh, Lin- uh, Barlasser. Mm. Um, yeah. Because I feel like Lindsay and Rathbone not do the same thing, but like that's a lot of energy. And I think having one of them to come off the bench... It's a really helpful thing because it's yeah. just they're just balls of energy, both of them. So. You can also have too much of the same thing if you have those. Uh, it's not always you, there are games where you're going to want just two balls of energy on pitch. Um, well, yeah, d- derby games, for example. Yeah, mm. but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, Barley's uh, Mick Barley has got to start. Got to start. You can't drop him. Can't drop him, can you? you just you can't. Have any of those three? No. Okay. No, I'm not changing that. You can't change that. Why would you? No. There, there is no reason to change that. The only, For me, the only selection dilemma that Paul Warren's got off of Saturday is, is how, he, how, if or how, he reorders that defence. Does he or doesn't he? Mm. And, and for me, it's only the centre three, the middle three, that he's got a question about. Chio starts on the right, Bowler starts on the left. Your midfield is as is. Your front two is as is. It's just, it's just those, those three. Woody mm. stays. Yeah. Do you have Icky and Harding at the side of him? Do you stick with uh, a combination of, you know, Fred, uh, Fred, Reg, and, Matt, and Matic? Yeah. Um, how uh, how unlucky Danny is to keep him a dolphin because he's coming <laughs> in as, yeah. as big money transfer, and so absolutely enough because one of his players done all right other than the Wigan game, he just can't get in team. No, and, and it's, it is really unfortunate for him because you can tell he is chomping at the bit to get in the team. Um, but at the same time, like like you say, you can't. It's never a bad thing to have too much of one thing. Like if we have a game where we're a bit under cosh and we need a bit more defensive cover, you can bring a doffin on for someone who's more of attacking threat. You know, it's like say, for example, if we, uh, I, I don't know, um, two 0 up at Portsmouth, which is a dangerous scoreline to be two 0 up at Portsmouth, Correct. and we're under cosh with twenty minutes left, get a defensive mind midfielder on who can still distribute but has that defensive mind to um, chip in when he can 
But like like you say, I, I don't want to be in Paul Warren's head on when, <laughs> whatever day it is when he picks the team. It's like I said in the press conference, him and the other coaches effectively just argue the toss for yeah. however long and he steps out and then comes in and makes the decision. I mean, I don't want to disagree with him, but I reckon it's just they throw all things at a dartboard and if you hit a double, <laughs> it's such and such starting. Or yeah. it's um, it's Rich Hughes won the argument this week, so he's made him do press. He's made him do press with old journals. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but no, like 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 you was like to say, I'd keep midfield the same. If the midfield's played that well against a team like Bolton, and Wales has got two, Rathbun was everywhere, Barlays is, was really good and deserves a start. I'd just keep it the same. Keep it. The, yeah. Keep a, a a winning starting eleven the same until it stops winning. Is yeah. my is my theory anyway. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a fair shout. Um, in the also in the, in the pre match with Radio Sheffield interview, <laughs> he talked about Ben Wiles. Um, and they give it, he talked about suggesting that Ben Wiles might be in line for an international call up, not in line, but they think he should be in line because he qualifies for Scotland. Um, uh, does he? And he does apparently so. Why is he good as a kid or something? I assume he's got grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you qualify for London now, then, Ben, since you live there? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll be fit for London national team. Yeah. yeah. Once we get rid of them. Yeah. Get rid of London, the rest of the country will be fine. Uh, but, yeah, that's something we're to watch out London, for. London, I'm first one out of county, don't we, about that? <laughs> um, oh, that'd, be, that'd be fantastic for Wiles. If he can get an international court f- for, for Scotland, that'd be superb for him. Uh, you know what, as well? Do you know why this is really thing. ironic? Yeah, I know what Dan is going to say. <laughs> it'd be really ironic because we play with Barry Bannon. That's no, 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 no. It'd be really funny if he benches Barry Bannon and starts. <laughs> <laughs> now that it would, would be, be very good. Yeah, it would. Oh, listen, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that is all I have. Is there any other topics? Any quick conversations you want to have before we wrap up? Because we've gone long. I mean, you were saying before we came on, before we started recording, Matt, that we weren't going to have a lot to talk about tonight. And here we are, an hour and six minutes later. <coughs> you all right there, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Caught him off guard with that one, mate. I'm back now. <clears throat> I, just, I just choked on nothing, absolutely nothing. That's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, also, if anybody is interested, keep an eye on the Icelandic League this weekend. Carry on as final game in impressional league football. If they win, they will win the title. So, as is a former legend, Miller's legend, keep your eyes out on uh, the, the called something like Vikinger. That's definitely not your pronoun. Vikinger, it? isn't it? Vikinger, Reykjavik, I think. Something like that. Um, so, keep um, an eye. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday afternoon they play. So, if anybody's interested yeah. in that, which I am. Sunday um, afternoon. Who plays yeah. well, well, They don't have much daylight in Iceland, do they? No. Let's get to time of year where it might be uh, getting a little bit. Dark. But they've got floodlights. Having said lights. that, I do think they have floodlights. I think they've got electricity there, I, I imagine, anyway. Yeah. Do you know what? Um, in um, in like Iceland and Norway, do you know like the AstroTurf pitches? A lot of them have underfloor heating. Uh, because if they didn't, they'd be out of use for nine months a year, yeah, whatever. Yeah. 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 Not nine months. Yeah, seven That's months. also another topic we could have covered after being an AstroTurf in lower league, but we're not going to cover because we ain't got time. Heated AstroTurf. Yeah, just I love fire. We could have also covered Pep Guardiola's stupid suggestion this week as well, but you know, what was his suggestion? He wants oh. to bring B teams in essentially. B what? B teams. B teams. Why to bring into the football league system? Yeah. Um, what the, a stupid the... idea! No, do you know what? That is the most. That is the most um, big club Sorry. rich guy idea in my. <laughs> If if you want to know, probably the vast majority of football supporters' response to that, if you go onto Twitter and look at Ian Bradder's account, he um, he gives a perfect response to it. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it made me laugh out loud, and it, and it fits perfectly. So uh, just go search for Ian Ian's tweet in response to Pep's suggestion. Yeah, it's it's not it shouldn't happen. It's not going to happen, uh, and keep. Keep it in your lane, Pep. I think you're one of the greatest managers of all time, but concentrate on yourself. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know what? It'd be good. Yeah, I one think of the best managers in the world, but behave. Yeah. yeah. I think if he gets us lot playing, it might be all right. I mean, if he gets us playing, I'll play. Mm. I, I, mean, I agree to the idea. 
Okay. Anyway, hundred. We've gone anyway, sixty nine minutes now, so let's finish this episode. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you to Tim and the Railway Podcast for helping us out with the scouting report. Uh, it's the first time we've done it as part of the episode. We'll see how see how that's gone down, and we may do it separately. We may do it together. We shall see going forward. Uh, we will be back on a Monday morning, and it's a Saturday Tuesday game. We've got a Tuesday night game at home to Wimbledon, so that will be a preview, a review of the crew game as we look ahead to AFC Wimbledon high flying AFC Wimbledon visiting the New York Stadium on Tuesday night. Um, I assume Ben will not be with us because I don't think Ben can watch the game this weekend after all talk about it. I think Ben's staying in London this weekend, so we will be yeah. Benless because he won't watch the game. So it'll be pointless having you on, Ben, uh, yeah. as much as we do love you. But it's been... Uh, you can sit down there with all your southern mates. No, um, because they can't understand me, but whatever. <laughs> Good. <laughs> don't, don't be losing that northern accent being down there. I'm not. There's um, some other northern lads, so I'm sticking with them, don't worry. Good. Um, but Mick and Danny... I'll see you guys on Sunday evening. Well, for, we'll, 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 we'll be live. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. Live on YouTube Sunday evening. We'll be back. So subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already so you can see us live. If not, the podcast will be out as always on Monday morning. Uh, thank you, Mick. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Danny. You're thank you, Tim, as well. You're welcome. We'll see you yeah, next time. Thank you very much. Pringle looking towards Agar. Ravel. Ambitious.